Conversations That Matter is a partner program for the Centre for Dialogue at Simon Fraser University. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. Blair King doesn't care what your argument is, so long as you have your facts straight. This has led him to become an active voice in a wide range of topics, in conversations that span multiple platforms. As an accredited earth scientist, he maintains that steadfast logic is needed. No, make that required when it comes to any number of complex resource-based subjects, from Site C to Kinder Morgan, from the benefits of renewable energy to the downfall of its accessibility. Blair is a voice of factual neutrality in a plethora of issues, and he freely shares his insights, much to the chagrin of people who are endeavoring to make an emotional argument. Today, we sit down with Blair King for a conversation that matters. Blair King, welcome to Conversations That Matter. Thank you for having me here. Well, it's my pleasure. I quite enjoy reading your postings, your tweets, your blogs, and everything else. But I have to admit that I have sometimes a little bit of trouble trying to understand, okay, what is it that you're hoping to achieve? But before we get there, let's just talk about your credentials as a scientist, because you really are an environmental earth sciences scientist. Yeah. Is that right? <laughs> Absolutely. I am a professional biologist. I'm a professional chemist. I, my undergraduate degree was in biology and chemistry, and I have a graduate degree, a PhD, in environmental studies and chemistry. Uh, I spent a decade working at the University of Victoria on topics relating to human impacts in the Strait of Georgia, uh, in Salish Sea, and have spent the last 15 years working in the contaminated sites industry where I run, organize, manage uh, rehabilitation, remediation of contaminated sites. So you care about the environment? Absolutely. That's what I've spent the last 25 years of my life doing, which is trying to get a better world for, the, for our kids in our future, trying to clean up industrial sites so they can be reused. I'm one of the people whose job it is to go out there and clean up the mess. That is very real um, interaction between human beings and Mother Earth. We do damage at times. Oh, absolutely. Our, our, our society damages the environment in any number of ways. We take away habitat from, uh, from animals. We use habitat for our own purposes. We use the atmosphere as a dump. We use the oceans as a dump. We dump stuff in, in landfills. We are a industrialized society and have industrialized, industrial level problems. And part of our life, part of our responsibility as a society is reducing that footprint so that the rest of the world, the rest of the inhabitants of the world, the rest of the creatures on the world have a chance as well because we may be the primary species on the planet but that doesn't give us the right to hold dominion over the rest of the planet. Planet needs wild space, wild space needs its opportunities to grow, develop, evolve without human impact. So at one time in my life I felt that we were paying very close attention to uh, very real pollution and uh, environmental damage that was in our, uh, in our immediate area and let's say nationally and, and even globally. These days I feel that there is a focus that has moved away from some of these things that are very tangible, they're real, we can point fingers at the people who are doing them and we can put into place legislation that uh, and measures to stop them from doing it and to remediate that. Are we paying as much attention to that as we used to 20, 30 years ago? Well, there's a bit difference. 20, 30 years ago, we went through a process where we recognized as a society that we had gone the wrong direction. The United States developed the Environmental Protection Act. Canada involved, uh, in, developed CEPA, the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, where we started to address the biggest of the issues. No more acid rain, no more mercury in water systems, getting rid of uh, hexavalent chromium in water, things that were 
immediately toxic and immediately problematic. And we've got relatively good at those big picture things and getting rid of the big picture. Now we're getting more refined. We, ha we, have, we still have impacted groundwater. We, have the, um, uh, we are impacting our marine environment and we are, do we are still doing it, but we are doing it at a slightly lower level. And so sometimes we don't see it as quickly. A lot of the effects we're dealing with now involve persistent compounds that take a long time to run through the system and so you don't see immediate reactions. Mm -hmm. It's not like a fish rolling over and dying in, in or the uh, Cleveland River bursting into flames. Now it's an orca with a body burden of PCBs that has lower reproductive success and so ends up having fewer babies and the population gradually declines. And so our aim nowadays is to do, now we've belt, dealt with some of the biggest pictures, we have to start dealing. And, and are we still doing a good job, even though you said that we've kind of lowered our sights on some of that, on some of those you know, big issues that we addressed before, are we still you know, aware of them and addressing them? Yes and no. In North America, we have been very good about it. The Europeans have been very strong about it. There are issues in large parts of the world and ultimately, environmental regulation and environmental protection has been definitively linked with developmental status. The richer you are as a nation, the more likely you're going to care about uh, the environment and the more likely you're going to protect the environment. Mm -hmm. When you're poor, when you're starving, you don't care whether you're cutting down the last tree to, bur to cook your dinner because you don't know if you're going to be around in six months to use the tree at, at that point. If you're in a country like ours, where I know that short of some cata uh, cataclysm, my kids are going to be around for 30 to 70 years, I have to look forward at the 30 to 70 year uh, viewpoint. Mm -hmm. But in parts of the world, in Southeast Asia, where people are living under energy poverty, where they're cooking their meals with dung, where they don't have that sort of security, they're environmental sensibilities are lower. The, the aquarium has been talking about plastics and ocean and how we can do our, our part to stop plastics and oceans. What we don't tend to note is that seven countries in, in uh, Southeast Asia are responsible for 95% of all the plastics that go in the oceans because they, we may use water bottles because it's convenient. If you're living in, in portions of India where there is no clean drinking water, the only drinking water you can get is water in a bottle. Mm -hmm. and, when they're, and if you're drinking 24 bottles a day or using 24 bottles a day and they don't have recycling, those end up in your garbage. If you don't have a good garbage system, they end up in your water system, they end up in the ocean. And so it comes down to how do we bring global conditions to a stage where we can improve it. But from a North American perspective, we do a, we do a pretty reasonable job. We still fail on a number of, of perspectives mm -hmm. and we're, doing our, we're trying our best to improve, but globally, uh, globally is where we really need to put the next level of effort. So if we are right now, as you pointed out, uh, dealing with more refined issues. And so we take a look at the release of CO2 into the atmosphere, the use of carbon-based energy, uh, the way we transport it. Uh, do we or don't we build Site C? Uh, and what sort of a uh, contributing factor is that? You then wade into those discussions because you say, hang on a second, some of the um, dialogue or the facts that are being used are off base. Why does it matter to you to bring your voice forward on these issues and say, because I recently read your uh, uh, article about Site C, why enter that debate? Because you must get pushback as well. Yeah, I get a lot of pushback and uh, my wife thinks it's rather funny that I spend this much time doing something that essentially brings me, all it brings me is uh, heartache because I do not get paid for this, I have no remuneration for this. It's something I do as a hobby. So why enter into a, a topic about Site C? And let's talk about Site C. Are you for it? Are you against it? Do you think that the arguments that are out there right now about it are evidence-based? 
answer to the last question is no. Uh, the answer to the, to the other question is I am for it because I don't see the alternatives given our current condition. Right now we are, British Columbia and Canada, sign, Canada signed the Paris Agreement on climate change. We've agreed that in the next, we are going to reduce our carbon footprint over the next 30, uh, 15 to 20 years. To do that, we need to, because almost all of British Columbia's current energy supply, electricity supply, not energy, electricity supply is made is via carbon-free or low-carbon sources, it means that any, the next cut for us to get down to where we need to be is going to be in the transportation sector, it's going to be in the housing sector. Mm -hmm. The Vancouver Sustainability Plan where they say no more natural gas in buildings, you're going to use electricity. Uh, that is going to drive up electricity demand. Mm -hmm. We currently have enough electricity for our current needs. If we then say that instead of driving car, instead of driving internal combustion cars, we're going to be driving electric cars, something's going to have to power those cars. And if you look at the choices out there, in British Columbia, hydro is the best alternative given all the other choices. And for reliable energy. For reliable, what we would call baseload energy, but it's essentially it comes down to reli reliable energy that can be turned on and off. Right. Wind is an excellent alternative. Wind is also intermittent. Mm -hmm. uh, and when it comes, if you want to do a cost-benefit analysis, you take a look at a map of British, a wind map of British Columbia, and you see that most of the really good wind resources are on the northwest coast and on the coast. Mm -hmm. That's not where people are. No. So to get that power to the grid means long transmission lines, which cost a lot of money. And, mm -hmm. and then so realistically, you look at Site C and you say, there are some real warts in the Site C program. There, we have not been fair and with the Indigenous people who are going to be hard hit by it. And admittedly, BC Hydro has worked really hard and they've come to agreement with a lot of these bands. And, and in those cases, they've done a great job. But there are, as I say, there are some arguments against Site C, but most of the arguments that are being used against Site C are emotional. Yes. And are not fact-based. But they're very effective. They're but very if effective. you want evidence-based uh, decision-making, those emotional uh, arguments don't fit. Exactly. Okay, that's part of your argument to support Site C. Why do you then enter into the uh, discussion around Kinder Morgan? I've, Kinder Morgan is, once again, another example of a situation where we have a number of less than ideal scenario choices. Right now, we on the West Coast use fossil fuels every day. I took a bus to SkyTrain, SkyTrain to here. That bus runs on fossil fuels. Our fossil fuels come from one or two, one of two places in the Lower Mainland. They are come via the Trans Mountain to the Chevron, now the Parklands refinery where they're refined. Mm -hmm. In they, Burnaby. In Burnaby. Yeah. Or also via the Trans Mountain uh, to storage facilities where they're offloaded. So the Trans Mountain is one of our two sources. Trans Mountain doesn't provide anywhere near enough fuel for us. As a consequence, we get the rest of our fuel from the refineries in the Puget Sound. And the from Pu Washington from State. From Washington State. Yeah. And the, and the refineries from Puget Sound have for the last uh, 50 years got their, their fuel from one of two places, from the Trans Mountain and from the Alaskan North Shore. The North Slope is drying up. The, the oil that used to be from, supplied via those tankers is no longer available. So the alternative for the Puget Sound is more, more oil from Trans Mountain, which, mm -hmm. which Trans is coming Mountain from is Alberta, which is fixed, yeah. or oil by rail via a, a rail system that is going all the way back to the Dakotas that provides back and crude, runs along the Columbia River up the west coast of the, west coast of, uh, the United States, mm -hmm. or alternatively, tankers from somewhere else. Yeah. But Ultimately, that fuel has to come from somewhere. The safest way to move fuel over land is pipelines. Let me ask you, yeah. is oil by rail a dangerous way to move oil? Oil by rail is 
at a minimum, 4.5 4 times more uh, dangerous than shipping by, uh, by pipeline. pipeline. I've shown that that number may be an understatement. That, that number is from the Fraser Institute, and a lot of people jump around saying it's Fraser Institute, therefore it can't be correct, except it's supported by similar studies in the United States that show that given that rail simply is not as safe as pipelines. Why? What makes transportation by rail not as safe as pipelines? Because we do see ruptures in pipelines, yeah. and yes, we have seen horrible catastrophes with rail uh, and oil. It comes down to routes and, uh, and uh, availability to problems. If you're running a, a rail line, if you're running along the edge of a mountainside in wintertime, mm -hmm you're going to have issues with slope stability. You're going to have issues with all, so, all sorts of issues that are not there if your pipeline is locked underground and therefore it can't be hit by a, can't be hit by a tanker truck. It can't be hit by a motor van. A landslide will not take out your, your, your train. Recently, and not very well reported on the West Coast here, a landslide took out a oil train on the Columbia and thankfully the train leaked not into the Columbia itself, but into a, 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 an area where the, where the rail could be controlled. So when people say, we want to protect our river, we want to put it by rail, what you're saying is we want to take it out of a pipeline, and the pipeline was built after the rail. A lot of the pipeline avoids, the rail lines in British Columbia almost were built back before the highways, they follow the rivers. Mm -hmm. The rail, the, the pipelines don't follow the rivers. The pipelines go overland, so the vast majority of their length, they aren't next to water. Mm -hmm. A spill at a pipeline in the interior is a mess, but it is a clean, it's a mess that can be cleaned up. A spill, uh, a spill into the river is a mess that is going to have ecological consequences all the way down the river. Mm -hmm. And so it comes down to the two alternatives. As long as we're going to need fossil fuels, we need to get to transport them. Right, Our, right now, the earliest we're going to be fossil fuel free is 25 to 30 years from now. So between now and then, we need to transport fuels. The safest way to do it is by pipeline, and therefore the Trans Mountain is the, the least of, the, bat, of the, the alternative bad options. Right, so I want to understand, you're not saying, okay, let's not transition, because I, it looks to me like the transition is inevitable. Uh, yeah. We want to move away from carbon-based fuels. Yeah. Um, there's no doubt about that. But how do we get from here to there in a way that is the most responsible is what I think I hear you say. That's exactly been my point in my blog and in my discussions, is we have to get from A to B. And in the process of getting from A to B, we have to be as responsible with our resources and responsible with our ecosystem as possible. Mm -hmm. And as long as we know that we will not, uh, that we will get to B, doesn't mean that we can ignore the process. And pipelines are one, are the safest way of getting us the resources we need while we transition, because ultimately, the, the activists are correct. If things turn out right, 70 years from now, those pipelines are going to be empty. Or those pipelines are going to only contain a small amount of fuel necessary to run the, all the other parts of our society. Because re realistically, hydrocarbons are used in every portion of our society. Right now. Right now. No, yeah. they, they are a necessary part of our society. Yeah. Every, plast every item of plastic you use is made out of hydrocarbons. Virtually, the, when we talk about the pharmaceuticals, every pharmaceutical is based on hydrocarbons from fossil fuels. I used to joke back in the day, back when peak oil was still a big issue, that eventually it would simply be too much of a waste to use oil in, gas, in cars because oil is far more valuable when used as plastics, as drugs, as, uh, and, as rubbers. We still recognize, though, that oil has an inherent use in our society, and we will never be fully oil-free. Yeah. What we're trying to do is be emissions-free. Yeah. And that's where, that's where in 100 years, our society will be carbon, will hopefully be carbon emission-free, while still maintaining the level of quality of life that we have now, or frankly, improving it for ourselves and 
uh, internationally. Because once again, if you don't improve the conditions in Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. if we don't, if we don't sell, uh, if someone doesn't sell LNG to India, then in lieu of building LNG plants, they're going to build coal plants. Because there are people in India who need, who need water, they need heat, they need electricity, they need air conditioning. They are going to, their government has accepted that this is a reality. They can't keep it from their people. Mm -hmm. Their energy needs are going to increase. We need to supply them with the cleanest energy possible because the current alternative, which is to say we don't care about them, isn't going to work because right. the flick of a pen in, uh, I've joked that the flick of a pen in China w erases, will erase 30 years of hard work in, in Canada. Uh, you're absolutely right. So if we can produce uh, a cleaner burning product yeah. now, natural gas has got uh, other issues as well. Yeah. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a perfect uh, solution. No, and that's why they call it a bridge fuel. Yeah. It, it is a bridge fuel that uh, will get people to where they, where they can then do the other things. Right now, you can't, in, in, mo in much of south southern India, they, can't, they don't have enough electricity to develop the industry that's energy dependent to do the next steps to pull themselves up to a stage where they can then start relying on, on uh, intermittents, mm -hmm. reliable, uh, renewable, intermittent reliable, uh, renewables. And so it, it's a matter of if you give them the hand up, they can then make the next steps themselves. But until we give them the hand up, give them the opportunity that our, for, our forefathers, our forefathers and foremothers had, we can't then expect them to behave in a manner that we, w that we would not expect of ourselves. Uh, so my sense is that you're saying this is a precious blue marble in space that we have to protect because there's nowhere else that we can go easily. And, but it's important that we do it in a responsible manner. Absolutely. Thank you very much for coming in and sharing this with us. Thanks.